artificial intelligence, AI, generative AI, chat GPT, GPT-2, GPT-3, man, AI has been at the center of so many conversations amongst marketers and businesses in the last few weeks. And that's why I'm excited because I went last week to the generative AI conference, the first AI conference devoted to AI content creation. And I'm excited today to bring you my 15 takeaways from the generative AI conference and hopefully to inspire you to not just experiment with, but use AI today in your business. And I'm gonna drop it all in this next episode of the Your Digital Marketing Coach Podcast. Hey everybody, Neil Schaefer here. Welcome to my podcast. I am your digital marketing coach and that's why I chose that name for my podcast. How the heck are you doing? It is a cold day in Southern California. We are having this really freak weather. Uh, there's snow uh, in the lower altitudes. I haven't seen any snow yet, but it's just really wet outside. And I am still, to be honest with you, a little bit fatigued. I ended up catching a cold in San Francisco. I, I left my heart. I guess I left my health in San Francisco as well at last week's Generative AI Conference. And that's what we're going to be talking about this week. Now, if you are a new listener to this podcast, welcome. Uh, every other week, I do a solo episode followed by an interview with a what I would like to believe are thought leaders in digital content, social media, and influencer marketing. Um, last week, I did a solo episode about authentically social media content. Normally, I would do an interview. Now, because I went to this conference and because I'm so excited about what I learned and because I want to share that with you so much, I am going to break tradition. This is going to be the second solo episode in a row. I'm going to have two podcast interviews in a row after that. Then we'll get back to the normal cadence. But I also have an interview following this with another company that is developing AI technology for marketers and businesses. Not the one that I'm going to talk about today, but another company to get their approach and once again, to help educate you and provide to you what one of the presenters at the conference last week said was AI literacy. We'll get into what that means, but you know, I am just going to jump right into this. Now, uh, I appreciate looking at my analytics. I've done these, uh, you know, X takeaways from content marketing world last year, from Vid Summit. There's still a uh, podcast movement. There's still a number of conferences that I actually promised to record takeaways from that I haven't yet, which is another reason why I wanted to make sure that I got this out there. So you're going to be hearing basically what I learned um, and you'll, you know, listen to me go over my notes as I talk, but I did try to organize these and really uh, format them in a way that would make it easy for me to tell them to you. So here we go. And I think really... We need to take a step back here before we talk about the application of AI to marketing, to business. We really need to take a step back and we need to see exactly what all this means from what we can call historical perspective. So we know that technology has had a positive impact and will continue to have a positive impact in productivity. And I'm summarizing you know, some of what the speaker said, I'll mention some names. Uh, I believe this was the CEO of Jasper who, uh, who gave this talk. But, you know, back in the 19th century, we had the light bulb. I mean, we had the printing press before that. We had the telephone, the x-ray, we had plastic. These are all pre-20th century inventions, right? 20th century, we saw the tank, which, well, revolutionized productivity on the war field. We saw nuclear fission. We saw the first successful AI program written by Christopher Strachey, hope I'm pronouncing his last name right, back in the 1950s. And there was a graph shown that if productivity of humans back in 1760, before the Industrial Revolution, if the outputs per hour were 100, then in 1960s, we had already hit 1,000. We had 10 x It took us 200 years, but we finally 10 x that productivity. Then in the 1970s, we had ATM. Now, I'm not sure if he was talking about the bank machine, uh, automated teller machine, or about network technology, but then we had email. And we saw our productivity output double again in 20 years, from 1960 to 1980, to 2,000 outputs per hour. The 90s welcomed the internet. We had social media. 
the 2010s welcome cloud storage and today we are close to 3000 outputs per hour we haven't doubled every uh, two decades uh, as we did before but clearly technology is allowing us to be a lot more productive but if we just look at modern business there are a few turning points that have defined modern business number one the internet removed barriers to start a business i think we can all agree upon that um, web 2.0 including social media we're not at web 3 yet but web 2.0 removed barriers to connection connect with anyone we want this was the topic of my very first book windmill networking right we can plug our windmills into the grid and send and receive electricity from anyone we want all around the world mobile technology removed barriers to purchase you didn't have to have a computer to uh, engage in e-commerce and it could be globally mobily etc cloud removed barriers to collaboration and in fact i would argue that the reason my economies didn't die during covid is because we had all these modern technology in place on the same note generative ai generative ai is defined as ai specifically for content creation co-creation whatever you want to uh, whatever you want to say or or describe it but generative ai removes barriers to creation and one of the themes of this conference was creation is not just text it's image it's code it's conversational chat and I'm going to talk about the business use case scenarios for these as well, above and beyond marketing, because they are truly compelling. And I think the quote that ended this opening keynote from the CEO was, this is one of those moments of technological breakthrough. There was a feeling of excitement in that room that I have not felt for quite some time. It reminded me, well, for those of you that might remember, there used to be a conference called Blog World. And it's the first time I saw Scott Stratton on stage. He had just written on marketing and, you know, saw Chris Progan and, you know, had pro bloggers sign my sign his book uh, on blogging that I bought and just all these stars in the room. And it was just this eye opening, amazing experience, which empowered my career. I think the early social media marketing worlds were the same for some people today. You know, going to one of these conferences for the first time is one of these moments. But generally, everyone in the room, there was a buzz. There was electricity. It was truly exciting to be there. And when they do this conference next year, I think it'll be at a much bigger venue, but obviously it is something that you will want to check out. All right, that was the first takeaway. The second takeaway is in generative AI, think of AI for content, AI for marketing. Jasper has become the clear thought leader in this emerging industry from my perspective. Go to neilshafer.com slash Jasper. Yes, it's an affiliate link, but it's a small uh, token of my appreciation if you would do that. Obviously, you're not paying more for the same product, and I am getting a little bit of a, a commission that helps fuel uh, my content creation. But, you know, it was really a recommendation from the Digital Marketer podcast. He is someone, the name is slipping me right now, but he's someone that I have interviewed on my podcast. And it was him a year ago, and I had asked him if he had started using these AI tools, and we were talking about tools in general. He had mentioned that by far, Jasper was the best of all these tools that were out there. So I took the plunge. I've been using Jasper for a year now. Um, with the emergence of ChatGPT and Jasper's integration with, with all these different uh, AI APIs, uh, I have found new use case scenarios, especially just in the past week after going to this conference. And that is the impact that I want this podcast episode to have onto you. So we all hear this buzzword of ChatGPT, which was developed by a company called OpenAI. They provide APIs for anyone to access, right? So that's why you see a lot of tools that are starting to tap in to AI. And even before ChatGPT, they were tapping in as well. There are various AI language models before ChatGPT, it was called GPT-3. Before GPT-3, it was GPT-2. So Jasper has been tying into all these. And therefore, when ChatGPT came out, they started tapping into that as well. Now, Jasper as a company it has an amazing product, but they announced some interesting new products. Um, one is Jasper Everywhere. So now it is a Chrome extension. Just like you use Grammarly anywhere in the internet, you can now use AI inside Gmail, for instance. Anywhere you want it, Jasper will be there with you. Jasper also introduced what I think is the future of AI for marketing, is having your own brand voice, having your own 
personal AI that really models your brand voice. So Jasper introduced brand voice. And it is still obviously a work in progress because it's very new. They showed us the intake screen. The intake screen, as you can imagine, had a few different inputs. And one of the inputs was, for instance, company bio. Another was product overview, uh, executive team overview, target audience, general information. Basically, based on the tone and the keywords, it's going to try to create a unique way whenever you ask it for any prompt in chat or just any general content creation, it's going to try to mold it in your unique brand voice. And here's the thing about Jasper. It's testing different AI models. It's learning from your prompts and it simply gets better over time. What's really interesting, uh, one of the speakers talked about Clay Shirky. Don't know how many of you are familiar with him, but uh, famous author, early days of the internet, Web 2.0. He was talking about back in 2010 how Web 2.0 was absolutely revolutionary. He was talking about how Wikipedia already had, well, today Wikipedia has a combined 4.2 billion words on wikipedia.com. My blog, neilshaper.com, I have over 600 blog posts. I aim for 2,000 you know, words per post. So I might have 1 million words, right? This year, the first six weeks of 2023, Jasper AI has already generated not 4 billion, not 4 trillion, but 15 trillion words. That is how far, that is how many people are using AI and generating content, right? And really, what he mentioned, which I think makes a lot of sense, is the only thing that has ever held our ideas back has been our inability to convey them. Thus, from AI, creating that content, the hours reclaimed that we can invest into thinking, expanding and refining on ideas and creating even better content is innumerable. And I'm going to talk about that when I get to some of the other talking points. But that's a really critical way of understanding how to leverage AI as part of a value add strategy. Um, and he started, you know, the whole conference by saying, look, demand on marketers is always increasing, but recourse resources always seem to be decreasing, right? With every new social media network like TikTok, every new content format like short form video, right? Um, there's always a need to do more, but marketers don't always get the resources to do them, especially when we are in a period of our economy where we are getting a little bit closer to what some might call a recession. We might have one, we might not. Um, but clearly today, baseline AI is a baseline part of most technology. And whether it's, you know, Google Suggest or you know, Gmail trying to figure out where to filter your emails. AI is already part of, of most technology at a very, very baseline level. But in the future, your brand's unique AI will become that critical uh, turning point of really personalized AI that really can represent your brand voice. So uh, I'm excited about this evolution of Jasper with Jasper Everywhere and Jasper Brand Voice. Once again, neilshafer.com slash Jasper Definitely check it out. It is one of these technologies. Whenever I recommend and use a technology and become an affiliate partner, it also becomes a technology I support. I support for my fractional CMO clients. I support in my digital first mastermind, and I will support you as well. So, uh, you know, if you invest, you can't figure out how to use it, hit me up. Um, whether it's through my podcast, socials, website, you know where to find me. All right. So those were only two of 15 different takeaways that I want to continue to go through here. So number three, let's look at AI for marketing. And the Jasper VP of marketing came in and gave a, uh, a very, very long talk, which I thought was the most relevant to my role in this world uh, of the specific way of strategically thinking about AI for marketing. So, she was very passionate and my apologies for not remember her name. I'm not so good at names. And to be honest with you, at conferences, they put names on the screen. And then, you know, the minute I try to take a, uh, a capture of it from my iPhone, they've already gone to the next screen. So, hey, if you're a speaker, keep your name up there a little bit longer. Put your name on more slides. I'll, I'll get off my, uh, <laughs> you know, my, uh, uh, I'll get off my throne now. But uh, getting back to takeaway number three. She was saying too often marketers see new technology 
and rush to the lowest bar of its creation. We've seen this, I think, most recently, like Facebook Messenger marketing. Um, you know, a lot of companies still try to do this with Instagram DMs of just automating cold emails. I would say is another way in which companies just, you know, buy lists, mass blast out emails without opt-in, et cetera, et cetera. So just because the barriers have dropped with AI doesn't mean our standards should. So the way she put it is for marketing, AI is transformational as I'm going to talk about, but it also requires transformation in strategy. So how do we shift these strategies? For instance, we can just create tons of content using AI, but is that really going to better our marketing? She gave a very specific example because she used to work at HubSpot in the heyday. Hey, I mean, content marketing is still in its heydays, don't get me wrong, but really in the heydays of HubSpot back in like 2015, 2016, she put a tweet up on the screen, which uh, showed Rand Fishkin, uh, then the CEO of Moz, you know, co-founder CEO, today he is the uh, founder and CEO of Spark Toro, one of the recommended tools from my new digital marketing tools guide ebook, by the way, which go to neilshafer.com slash freebies and definitely download that. Um, he put out a tweet calling out HubSpot because during one week, they published 49 new unique blog posts. And he's like, do you have any research or any data that suggests that that is the optimal frequency of publishing content on your blog? So someone, I mean, it really impacted the people at HubSpot, apparently. So someone said, what if we tried to publish less content? And they actually found, doing some analysis, that 92% of their leads and 76% of their views came from their old blog posts. So instead of always creating new content, why don't we take our old content and treat them as assets and further improve upon them. Now, this is something that I've talked a lot about. You build a library of content. Once you have it, you optimize it over time. It's good for SEO. You're building, the content becomes an asset, right? She gave one example. How to write a press release. This went from a conversion after republishing it, revising it, making it a better piece of content. It went from a conversion rate of 1.15% to 3.92%. It's a pretty significant increase. Furthermore, a 106% increase in organic traffic and a 2x increase in total leads. So it's not about the quality, it's about the quantity. And good content, truly good content, requires ideation. She basically said there are five stages for content marketing, right? Ideation, research, composition, or we could call that the sheer content creation piece, editing and distribution. But it seems that content marketing today it's just about the composition, just about the creation. And there's not enough value placed on the other areas. And maybe it's just because there just aren't enough resources above and beyond what is required to create the content, right? That is why an AI-assisted content strategy can help you create more of that content in that composition or that content creation, that middle part of what a content marketing process looks like to free up time to improve upon all of the other aspects. And I think she framed this in a really, really compelling way. With advertising, the biggest budget's won. With content marketing, the biggest capacity won. The biggest ability to share, you know, produce more content, right? And with AI, the best ideas will win. Specifically with generative AI, the best ideas will win. You can create content, but it's trash in, trash out. If it's a bad idea to begin with, it's gonna be bad content going out. So for instance, the time it could free up to help you, help you create the content, why not go out for your research instead of just always quoting Statista, why don't you go out and interview your customers, create your own data sets, right? This is also going to not only help you create better content from the research, but it also increases the chance that people will link back to you. It's going to be better for SEO and it's going to raise the boat for that piece of content as well as all of your other pieces of content potentially, right? Um, and what's really interesting for those of you who are thinking, well, and I'm going to talk about the impact that AI is going to have on SEO, 
but even Google has said the following about AI created content. This is Danny Sullivan, who is Google's sort of search liaison, like the public face of Google. This is a tweet from November 7th, 2022, where he said, and I quote, we haven't said AI content is bad. We've said pretty clearly content written primarily for search engines rather than humans is the issue. That's why, that's what we're focused on. If someone fires up a hundred humans to write content, just to rank HubSpot, or fires up a spinner or an AI, it's the same issue. So AI is not the enemy and you can rank with AI content. I have ranked with AI content, so I, I know this for a fact and I won't go into the details. I'm actually in the process of creating a course all around everything I'm talking about here that will include advice on using AI for your content creation and, and SEO process. But, you know, if we can use that time freed up for research, we can do the same for distribution. And one of the messages that came out was, and this is going to be takeaway number four, is we might start to see a decline of search engine traffic. And the reason is ChatGPT is so good and we saw Microsoft invest in OpenAI and, and you know, uh, release uh, ChatGPT as part of its Bing uh, search engine, which now is, has never been as relevant as it was since Windows 3 or Windows 95. Um, if you rely primarily on search engine traffic, you will probably want to work a little bit harder on distributing your content in other areas. So once again, we have more time now for distribution to reinvest in the places that are going to become more consequential. And she finished her presentation. Unless you elevate the quality of your content, you will lose in an AI generated content world. This is one of the most important messages of this episode is that if you're not doing this, someone else might be, and it might be one of your competitors, right? But I want to get to that point. Number four, takeaway number four, decline of search engine traffic. And I want to give this more context. I also don't want you to freak out because unless you are the king of SEO for your industry, this may, you know, even if search engine traffic halves and you only have a 1% market share to begin with, you can still double your search engine traffic over time. It just means that if you are at the very top and you've done content marketing really, really well, and you own all the terms and you have like 35% or 50% coverage or, you know, number one search engine ranking for all those key keywords in your industry, you might see a drop from search engine traffic with the emergence and ChatGPT becoming more mainstream. Google is now looking into, they call it Google Bard. How did they, you know, introduce this technology? But there were some pretty amazing stats. So Stack Overflow is a site where a lot of website development coders and, and application coders go looking for information. And I believe, I'm not sure if it's owned by the same company as uh, the company that was on stage called Replit, but they said since the emergence of ChatGPT a few months ago, they have seen a 15% month-to-month decrease in traffic going to Stack Overflow. The reason is that developers are finding their answers in ChatGPT. Now, I had a conversation with someone that is going to appear on the next episode. So make sure you hit that subscribe button if you haven't. But he had a conversation with someone at Microsoft who believes in two years, this person at Microsoft said search engine traffic might be down by 50%. Now, who the heck knows, right? And will ChatGPT take over all of search engine traffic? Absolutely not. But there are cases where ChatGPT actually produces a more relevant answer. I'm gonna you know, give you one example. One of my fractional CMO clients, they're in the channel marketing world. And therefore I was looking at, you know, uh, we, I was doing a Google search trying to help them create a bullet point list of industries that they might wanna target. Industries that rely on channel marketing, channel, uh, channel sales. Uh, you know, partnership marketing, partnership sales. And so I did a Google search, you know, top uh, industries for channel marketing or top uh, top technology industries by uh, employee count. And as you can imagine, Google did its best, but it ended up showing a lot of results that said the top companies, the top tech companies, right? And I wanted to find out industries by employee count. I went to ChatGPT and then boom, it actually produced a much better result. If you haven't been experimenting with ChatGPT, you should. Once you have these aha moments, you begin to see this potential. 
So yes, we are gonna see some interesting numbers and that's why just like I continue to monitor my Twitter traffic and Twitter analytics on a monthly basis to see the changes that are going on there, I'd say the same thing about Pinterest. You know, search engine traffic, you need to really keep a close eye on, not just the most recent few months, but the few months coming ahead and the few years coming ahead to see how all of this might affect it. Now, takeaway number five was the creativity that AI can foster, right? As marketers, we tend to think, oh, we'll just create lots of content using, you know, using ChatGPT or Jasper, what have you. Um, Zach King was one of the keynotes. Zach King is this famous YouTuber, tens of millions of subscribers, and he also still has the most watched TikTok video. So he actually went on stage, just from a video content creation perspective, he created this video from his iPhone. It took him a minute to do, I actually filmed him creating the video, but he basically said, I want you all to put up your hands and I'm gonna ask for a volunteer from the stage, keep your hands up the whole time. We all did this. He picked someone to come up on stage and he used his hand and sort of like went whoosh to like uh, indicate he was bringing that person on stage. And then he did this other like, you know, abracadabra whoosh uh, to like let the person out of his hand. And then the person jumped on stage. And then he went into his, I believe his standard uh, video editing tool, you know, within the photos app, he might've been using CapCut, I'm not sure, but within, you know, it took him a minute to make the video. It took him 15 seconds to finalize it. And it looked like he literally pulled someone out of the crowd with his hand and then dropped them on the stage from his hand. It was pretty compelling, right? Um, so this is one of the most creative people in the world that showed us how to do this. But what was really interesting was after he did that, he said, I'm gonna tell you my life story. And because my parents didn't take a lot of photos of us growing up, I'm gonna use visual AI it's called DALI. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, Jasper also has the ability tapping into DALI to create visual art. But he basically used AI to generate lost images of his youth that no longer exist to tell his story. He also explained that when he struggles to find words, has a hard time capturing ideas, when he can't visualize something, he uses AI to generate ideas for new videos. This is one of the most famous and successful YouTubers. He also said, you know, he sort of felt like he ran out of ideas after about 200 videos, right? But with AI, it has changed the way he works from being inspired to create, to create to inspire. I thought that was a pretty compelling quote that I wanted to share with you. He also talked about his ideation process. He has a three-step process to generate new ideas. So ideation is one of those critical parts of content creation. He will have an idea dumping session. Now, this is what he has with his team, but he will literally just dump 50 to 100 ideas in an hour. You can imagine how AI can help give you lots of ideas in a very short period of time. Um, he then has an idea refinement. And from the idea refinement, he then has execution through a storyboard. Now, he usually would have created manual mock-up storyboards to show the different visual scenes of a video. Now he uses AI to create visualizations. So he showed us one really, really compelling scene. It was actually a video. <coughs> Excuse me. Podcasters need to drink coffee too, right? And he showed us a video of him with his two young children. I think they were like three and five. And he basically asked them to create a monster using AI. So he was tapping into his kid's imagination to create a monster. So I think his five-year-old, a little bit older, you know, I want to create like this, you know, this red dragon breathing fire over the skyscrapers of a big city. And then boom, the image came out, right? The kid was was really happy. The three-year-old's like, I want to make like a, a white cute monster. And what's really amazing is, and the video showed it, after he created this white cute monster in AI, he took off. He went to the corner of the room where his art supplies were, and then he started to draw that picture that he had generated with AI. He started to hand draw that monster. Create to inspire. Something to think about.
And one of the big messages from this conference was humans collaborating with technology, right? It's all about the creativity that AI can help unleash, not just robotic text. All right, takeaway number six, we can't ignore the impact that AI is going to have on the business world. And when we talked about all those different changes in technology, a lot of them came for blue collar jobs, but it is clear AI is coming after white collar jobs. In fact, it is mostly impacting jobs that require people to have bachelor's or graduate degrees. The way to look at it this way is, it's going to help you do your work better. GitHub created an AI tool called Copilot to help coders more quickly develop. It will help programmers be efficient, more efficient if they use this, right? And unless you become more efficient, you might no longer be necessary. And that's why we want to make sure that we're on top of this and using it in the most efficient way possible. They also gave, and it was actually the New York Times journalist, also author, uh, Kevin Roos. I'm going to talk a little bit about what he talked about in a second. But he mentioned that Google has an entry test for software developers. And they had ChatGPT take this uh, software code development test for first-time employees. And it not only passed the test, but it ranked at about an annual salary of $180,000, and it's only going to get better. So instead of trying to learn it all yourself, take advantage of the fact that the AI can do a lot of it for you and work on higher level issues, similar to how marketers should work on higher level issues like ideas and distribution. And this power of ideation is critical for business. It's critical for marketing, but takeaway number seven is this power. And the CEO of Jasper gave this example of a 50 person company that provides window tinting services for cars. And they were using Jasper and he found out, you know, the success story after talking to them because they're a customer. And he realized, or the CEO of this company realized, you know, how do I convince people in our marketing messages to why would they want to tint their auto? And so he went into Jasper, went into Jasper chat based on ChatGPT, basically typed in, give me reasons why I should use auto tint. The first thing that Jasper said was to prevent UI rays from harming children. That idea became central to the marketing messaging of this company. And they were able to exponentially grow their business as a result of that from the idea that came from AI, AI for ideation. You still need to implement it. You still need to create your marketing messages that redo your website, your, your advertising, everything else. But the idea came from AI. I thought that was a great example showing this power of ideation that's generated from AI. Generative AI, thus the word. Okay, now I already hinted at this as well, but takeaway number eight out of 15, we still got a ways to go. This is if your mind isn't blown now, I mean, my, my mind, like I said, was, was already blown after the first keynote. But it's not just marketing. Another area where AI is really hitting hard is code development. So we had GitHub Copilot. We had Replic Ghostwriter. We had two different companies on the stage in a panel. And the message here, I think it's similar for marketers. Don't fight technology. Leverage it because that is what your competitors are doing. Now, Replit gave a very, very interesting uh, example of a, uh, a teacher that is using Replit Ghostlight in their teaching. In fact, it says there are many innovative teachers that teaching software code development that are actually using this AI ghostwriting feature as part of their teaching. So the idea is teach it and give children, give students guardrails. If you think about it that way, AI can critique your work and give you feedback. And, you know, what's funny is that OpenAI said, and they were part of this panel, that they didn't even realize you could use ChatGPT to code websites. And here we are. Could you use ChatGPT to replace Grammarly to check for punctuation errors? Maybe. 
I found ways of using ChatGPT to summarize articles, for instance, to give a, a concise summary. Um, I've used ChatGPT to create Twitter threads. There's no recipe for it, but it's all about what they call prompt engineering, understanding how to prompt the AI to come out with a more relevant answer. And this is part of what I'm gonna talk about this AI literacy. But this is where you begin to uncover the true productivity and efficiency and how AI becomes your competitive advantage over time. So AI should augment, just same with software code development teaching, it should augment your teaching, not replace it. And as a reminder, OpenAI said, there are still ways of using AI that have yet to be discovered. I think you'd agree um, bringing uh, you know, up these examples. You know, Replit said that AI is bringing coding out of the dinosaur age, right? You no longer have to understand how HTML works to build a website. You know, we, we, we have no code websites. This is taking it we're one step further to no code applications. And in the same way that AI is making coding more accessible to anyone, even if you don't know coding, it is making marketing, it is making content creation more accessible as well. And, you know, there are other examples of this. Canva is a great example of a tool that made graphic design accessible for everybody. It's, it was actually an example that was brought up that I'm going to get to in another takeaway. Takeaway number nine is it's not just sheer content creation for marketing. It's not just code development, but it's also conversations. It's chatbots, right? So Jasper gave an example of one medium-sized company of around 10,000 employees that leveraged ChatGPT to answer customer inquiries. Now, they didn't send out the responses from ChatGPT, but they wanted to test if they just served them these raw customer inquiries, would the responses from ChatGPT be good enough? Well, guess what? They ended up using 80% of those answers. And actually, they were able to provide a better user experience because they were able to respond faster with a chatbot. Didn't have to wait for a phone call. Didn't have to wait for a response from a human on the other end of that chatbot. And, you know, they also said, similar to, you know, my own feelings about how sometimes using ChatGPT gives you a better search experience. You know, let's say you are on Hotels.com. This was the example. And you want to find a hotel in New York City that is within a five-minute walking distance of Penn Station that has Wi-Fi, it has at least 10 stories, and is okay with you bringing a pet, right? This is something that a chat GPT type technology might actually give you much better response to than just using general search. And you can imagine if a hotels.com operator was trying to respond to the chat, that might also take them a lot of time as well. So frankly speaking, ChatGPT chat GPT can bring you better results. And this, this notion of how AI is making all this more accessible there is an example of a virtual executive virtual assistant company. So a VA company for executives. And they are using um, VAs to handle customer facing problems. But now they want to use AI before they use human beings. They actually hired a 13 year old kid in India to develop the code that would empower their chatbots to be able to do this. And they did it at a really, really inexpensive price, as you can imagine. So this is how accessible AI is making all these different business operations. Speaking of business operations, takeaway number 10 is how AI is making art, the visuals more accessible as well, not just text and audio as well. There was an example of a Hollywood movie studio that needed to create a mock-up for an 18th century site. This would have normally required a few hundred thousand dollars in investment that they were able to do using AI, visual AI, for $60. They mentioned this product now became something called Lenza. And Lenza is on a mission to, be, to enable you to create AI video. So they're actually in the process of um, processing like thousands of Bollywood movies <laughs> he said, sorry, when you create your next AI video, uh, the skin might be brown and not white. Uh, the, the founder, I think, is Indian as well. But um, the idea is that you'll be able to create any video, any visual or, or moving image you want to create, 
just like you can create a static visual now with AI, AI as well. Um, on the visual AI, you can now create images, 40 images in one second, unoptimized. So we went from Adobe Photoshop to Figma to Canva, and now with AI, truly everyone is a designer. Uh, there was a quote that only 40% of Figma users are designers, and I bet you we, less than 40% of Canva users are designers. Well, AI allows 100% of people to be non-designers, and it's really going to make everyone a citizen developer, a citizen content creator, a citizen artist. In fact, there was an example of someone that generated music score leveraging AI. It was a combination of New Orleans jazz and rap, and it was actually played for us, and that musical score was generated using AI, and it sounded actually really, really good. So um, it's not just textual content, right? Generative content it goes across all the different mediums, and that's why we're going to see a lot of innovation outside of text. ChatGPT is really only the beginning. We're going to see it in other mediums as well over uh, the next several years. So we are still only two thirds done here. I want to get into Kevin Roos's keynote. Now I don't have his book in front of me, front of me, but uh, it was handed out. It was a book all about how AI is is going to change us all, right? And it, I, I think it was called Future Proof or How to Future Proof. Um, and that was really the subject of his talk was what will save us from AI? And he was saying, you know, there's a lot of work that AI can't do. AI can't do work that is surprising. It can't do irregular chaotic work. It can't do physical work like uh, be a burst at a Starbucks. And it's, it's hard or it can't do work that's hard to codify that you can't teach it. So, in other words, if you want to future-proof yourself your job, you can make your job, he said, gave out three different things. Make your job more surprising, more social, and more scarce. It could work for anyone or any business. He gave the example of an accountant he, who made himself less replaceable. This accountant happened to be a former comedian. So Kevin's like, you know, when I meet my accountant every year for my taxes, he doesn't dread meeting his accountant. He loves meeting his accountant. And in fact, his accountant hires other comedians that are now accountants. So you have this accounting firm full of comedians. The work they do is the same on the back end. They may not be the best accountants, but it's the human facing aspect that is the sticky point that helps them retain and increase their customer base. I thought that was a really, really great um, way to put it. So this, and I would say that not all of the accountants are former comedians, but basically he pays for them to take improv comedy lessons. Okay, really brilliant. And in the words of that accountancy CEO, he said, our advantage is the conversation. It's the human conversation. It's the comedic conversation, right? That at the end is something that AI will never take away from that business. What about work that AI won't do? Well, social work, fulfilling social or emotional needs, experiential work, artisanal work. Uh, this sort of reminds me of Seth Godin when I saw him speak like a decade ago, was talking about at the end of the day, only the work of artists, the, the people facing work, the emotional work is going to be the final work that remains that there will always be demand for. And I was reminded of that during this speech. Or what about scarce work, high stakes work, you know, aircraft uh, controllers, people that oversee our, our nuclear arsenal, for instance, um, low fault tolerance, observable excellence. And I think this also relates to marketing the power of audio and video content, as well as emotion and storytelling. So AI will improve upon these, but getting back to, well, if AI is going to be, get better at helping us create text, but it's not yet there in audio and video, I believe that just means we should be placing more importance on video content and on audio content because there are ways to do more stellar storytelling, to be more emotional, to show a more human side than we can do through text and that it will become our competitive marketing advantage over time. So a few quotes from Kevin, future proofing ourselves means using AI to enhance our humanity, not erase it. Remember, ideation become more creative. Let AI be AI and humans be humans. Another interesting point that he made when he was like, who do you think AI helps? AI 
will allow you to launch a company with fewer employees and have more leverage. So actually, the solopreneur, the entrepreneur, the smaller business, the smaller your business, the more positive impact AI can have. The larger your business, the more defensive you become. So he predicts there's going to be a new explosion of entrepreneurs that AI is going to help in many, many different ways. And I couldn't agree more. And I'm really excited about helping educate those entrepreneurs, not just in AI, but everything digital first marketing. But this is evolving really, really quickly. Even Kevin, who has been researching AI as a New York Times reporter for the last five years, said he only first heard of this generative AI term in October of 2022. That is how far and fast this has evolved. It is now the name of the conference. And I hadn't even heard of generative AI until I found out about the conference myself, uh, which was in January of 2023. All right, we had another speaker and I'm gonna put, try to put the names of these speakers in the show notes. Uh, my apologies, I didn't take notes on them. Once again, they went through their uh, introductory screens too fast, but she is a PhD student at MIT on AI literacy. And I think this is really important because this becomes that core skill that I think every professional is going to need. She defined AI literacy as a person's ability to confidently understand and interact with AI-based systems, right? Understanding the prompt engineering, how to give it a better prompt, how to analyze its outputs. And the reason why this is important, and she's been obviously researching ChatGPT as well, is that ChatGPT sometimes generates incorrect information. It doesn't intend to, but it happens. They called it uh, AI hallucinations. Uh, go figure. Um, it can also sometimes produce harmful instructions or biased content. And it has limited knowledge of world events after 2021. I think June 2021. It's based on a database of everything on the, inter on the internet before then. But it is not real time. Now, ChatGPT does have some real time functionality. I have been... Uh, training it to, like I said, summarize blog posts. So if I came out with a blog post yesterday, I can go to ChatGPT and basically put in the URL of that blog post and ask it to summarize it. I can ask it to summarize it in a hundred words. I can ask it to tell me what the main points are. I can ask it to put all this in the language of Gary Vaynerchuk if I wanted to. Not That's something I don't want to do, but um, you get the picture, right? And it's funny because when she started this presentation, she said, I don't know how many of you follow me on Twitter, but every single tweet that I write was actually created using Notion's AI tool. I mentioned Adobe has an AI tool. Everybody has AI now. So it's not, it's not something to be, I think we're all sort of still embarrassed that we talk about it, but she's like, we don't have to be because they're still my ideas, right? AI just helped in, in the, the creation of that final content, but the ideas are all mine. And this is something really interesting because whether I am writing a book or whether I am having someone else write the book for me and I'm rebranding it or I'm completely outsourcing it to a third party company or I'm buying someone else's rights and creating my own book. You know, at the end of the day, it has my name. It represents my thoughts and it's out there in the world. Same goes with marketing content. It might be you writing the content. It might be an employee that you hired. It might be a freelancer. It might be an agency or it might be AI, but at the end of the day, it has your brand's imprint on it. I want you to think about that because that's sort of where we're going. And if you've ever outsourced content creation, like an overwhelming majority of businesses have, obviously leveraging AI as part of that should not seem foreign to you. It should not be embarrassing. It should be a competitive advantage as you learn how to use it better with improvement in your AI literacy. And I'll end this takeaway with her quote, AI can help you get to where you wanna go, but it can't tell you the right direction to go. It's always based on human input, our input. Always remember that. There are always ways to improve. There are ways to make this a competitive advantage. The gentleman sitting next to me when this conference ended is a web developer, or I should say a website developer. And he would always go through these questions with his clients of, you know, when developing a new website, who's your target persona? What are your products? Um, you know, what's the strategy? All these different questions. Well, he spent so much time in JetGPT with prompts that he was able to basically create a recipe that instead of taking him weeks to create a website, he can literally do it in an hour. And he does it through these unique prompts that he created that helps get that information and get the right output he needs 
to go and create the website. I want you to think about that. Funny thing is, he is now going to productize that and sell it to agencies so that they can more easily create websites using AI. So we are just at the very tip of the iceberg here, my friends. There's going to be a lot of innovation, a lot of products like these that are going to help us. But once again, this is based on a lot of time spent experimenting with different prompts to get different answers and training the AI to give him the answer he needs to get that right output. Now, in that sense, it's a great way to introduce talking point number 13. The reason, now I am an affiliate partner with Jasper, but the reason why I want you to consider using Jasper is every AI tool is building a community that makes the AI more valuable for that community because it helps improve the generative AI. The more people that use Jasper, the more Jasper users benefit. It's because AI can tap into a bigger data set of more people and specific prompts and specific feedback. So this is only going to get better. And that's why I believe it's important to go with the gorillas. And for marketing, I believe Jasper is the gorilla. There, there's going to be a few companies I'm going to introduce to you on this podcast. I'm going to have some webinars coming up. There are other companies out there that are similarly creating their own communities, their own data sets that you'll want to consider as well. So we're now at talking point number 14. And this is where we go back and look at the big picture. Because every C-suite executive right now is being asked, what is their generative AI strategy? So the advice is, AI-assisted code developing will make developers 10x to 100x more productive, that every employee can potentially contribute to software development. That is huge, right? Whether you're creating an app, a website, an internal software process, whatever it is. But the other thing is that AI can be a search tool. It can be a copy generator. It is this foundational tool that will help you create an app, a strategy, uh, a product from unstructured data. It becomes part of your infrastructure. And that's why I believe we should be embracing it, but in an intelligent and a strategic way as I've been outlining in this episode. And then... The last quote, number 15. So I had a podcast episode last year where I'd said, now's the time we all need to be experimenting with AI. Well, I believe now is the time we need to be doing AI. And the final quote from the CEO, which I believe was one of the final quotes of the conference was 2023 is the year where every business will feel the positive impact of AI. And I believe that as well. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, as you can see, I'm really passionate about it because if my role on earth is to help educate and empower and inspire, uh, I cannot think of another episode that hopefully will have that impact and inspiration as this episode has or hopefully has on you. I would love your feedback. If you have any questions about anything I covered, if you want me to talk more about this on future episodes, drop me a line neil at neilschafer.com. I'm Neil Schaefer everywhere on social. Once again, go to neilschafer.com slash Jasper. Try out Jasper. Let me know what you think. And once again, I want to thank you for downloading, for subscribing, for listening. Hopefully some of you have reviewed this podcast, but I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. This is your digital marketing coach, Neil Schaefer, signing off. Well, that ended the actual recording of my podcast. I know that we have some viewers in the house. If there were any questions that you had, this would be a great time to ask them. Oh my gosh, there! I didn't even see the chat on the side. I was waiting for the questions. Um, hey, Charlie boy, I appreciate your jumping into the live stream. I actually want to do more of these live streams. This is really uh, an experiment. Uh, as you can see, um, you have that little Zoom icon in the bottom right. I'm not embarrassed by it by any means. Uh, Zoom was just the easiest way for me to live stream uh, because I already have a Zoom account, a uh, paid account, and it comes with free live streaming. So why the heck not? I hope you enjoyed this. If you have any questions, put them in the chat, put them in the comments. Um, feel free to reach out to me if I can be of any help. And I'm going to sign off. So thank you once again and have a great rest of your day. Ciao.